www.ccradio.org. This is a Camden Community Radio program for Refugee Week Radio. Different past, shared future. My name is Jason Manseray. Quite often, when we think of refugees and asylum seekers, we overlook lesbian and gay people who have suffered violence and or sexual abuse in their home countries. I met a young man from Sri Lanka who discussed his incredible journey that eventually led him to the United Kingdom. My name is Hari Shivananda Sharma and I come from Sri Lanka and I'm 22 years old. Yes, there was this soldier guy. Um, I don't know how to describe it. I would say an intimate sexual affair now, looking back at it. But it wasn't just that. It was um, more of a friendship, I would say, but it had a sexual element in it. And uh, how, how old were you? I was 12. Mm, how old was he? I would say roughly about 20 to 25. So does that mean that at that age, you know, you knew that you were gay? I don't know, because that was my first sexual experiences, and in Sri Lanka we, we don't get uh, taught about sex until we are um, uh, 15, so I didn't know anything really about the sex, sex part of it, and, but um, I thought it's something people do or something, I don't know, I don't know what it felt, but uh, I didn't like the sexual part of it, I, I disliked it, but I, I disliked his company, because mostly because I was lonely and I didn't have a father maybe. When did you and other people start to identify you that you might be... Uh, well, I was aware of it when I uh, hit the age of 13 in Jaffna because I, in Jaffna you had access to uh, magazines from Tamil Nadu and magazines from all over the place really. Even you had a, we had a Reader's Digest and uh, you know all these things and uh, I kind of started reading and then became aware of, you know, I started reading novels and stuff so I kind of knew what went on there. So and uh, I, I, I didn't know the term for it. And I, because I didn't know the term gay until I was 16 or 17, but I kind of know, okay, yes, I am attracted to men. Um, yeah, uh, we, f we faced bullying, but I, I had my own coping mechanisms, like, um, you know, staying too close to the teachers and pretending to read a book while the bullying goes on, or, you know, stay on the front bench instead of the back bench, or, you know, that, that sort of mechanism. And I... Yeah, I, I became a teacher's pet really to escape the thing and I uh, I don't, in the, during intervals or play times I don't go to the playground, I just go to the library so that's a <sighs> secure environment for me. Did you find another outlet for, you know, your, your, I guess your stresses, you know, that you were encountering? Well, the first thing I did was uh, writing, uh, writing the diary and uh, sending it to a publisher in India and then commit suicide. That's what I was going to do because it was an act of revenge, and uh, that's what a poet did in early 90s in Sri Lanka. She just burnt herself to death after publish uh, after sending her poems to a friend. So I th I took that as an inspiration, and then I thought, okay, this is the only way to tarnish the whole society. <laughs> but uh, but then I got saved. And How I, did you get saved? Well, my mother found out my letters and she uh, rushed to emergency care and I was put up in emergency care and then they um, referred me to a psychiatrist to help and I got a social work allocated for me and then they advised me to change the school from Kokil Hindu College, which is the Hindu college, to a um, non-religious school, which is Jaffna Central College, to do my A-levels. And that's where I had this access to public library, because the school was very uh, near to the public library. The public library had internet access. Mm -hmm. Now, I got a computer, because I got uh, good results in all of So what I would do in the night time is uh, writing, the, writing stuff up uh, at the house, and when I go to school, I'll, um, I will keep it in a floppy disk. And then uh, after the school, I would uh, rush to the library and uh, uh, try to post it on a blog spot. Uh, I, had a, I had a blogger account. And then uh, designing was nearly impossible. So I didn't really have any time to format the text. It was just bland text, yeah. unformatted text. But peep, I sent it out to uh, some people in the diaspora community, well-known writers and, you know, well-known individuals in the diaspora. I sent it, uh, the address to them via email, and then they got back to me saying, this is really, really important stuff, and it's really important that you're writing from the zone itself. And uh, and uh, it, was, it was very supportive, and this way I can uh, 
I can't deal with the revenge thing. Yeah, I, I, then I um, thought, uh, okay, I, this is time to, um, you know, publish really rebellious stuff. So I thought, um, I fictionalized my encounter with the soldier guy. It was highly descriptive and homoerotic, deliberately beyond the limits of conventions, I suppose. And uh, I published it online. And um, it's a kind of a double life. Yeah, double life. Because on the online, uh, in online, I had this identity, and in, in secret, I, I was scared to death because. <laughs> Yeah, it was a it was a tough time and um, I had this revenge to write bad things about everyone like my teacher or the family or the religion everything I, I had this ridiculous urge to tarnish the values I would say um, and so I'll, but I couldn't do it in public so I started I kept the diaries in secret I started writing it and then I um, and I also was reading the novels and literary publications. So then I, when I hit 16, I kind of realized the literary value of it. So I started writing specifically about the schools I attended. And it was very c confessional, like, you know, based on very uh, true events and true names. Yep. So people, I think somebody might have Googled their school name. I don't know how did how it get into the notice of you know, the people who are affiliated with my school or the Tamil Tigers. I don't know how it got uh, their attention, but anyhow, um, yeah, it was the Tamil Tigers. I, not the Tamil Tigers, because the, the Tamil Tigers are a very um, diverse organization. They have, like, affiliations with schools because they target schools as their main line of activity because they didn't have any control over the Jaffna area. They had, uh, they, their base was in Vani, but they kept in contact with the schools in order to carry out activities like um, carrying out uh, attacks on sentry points or distributing grenades, hand, hand pistols and stuff. And they were very, very culturally orthodox. They tried to protect Tamil cultural values in order to stand up to the Sinhala oppression. So mm -hmm. th they thought cultural values are very important and society has to stay orthodox in order to preserve the Tamil cultural identity. So any act um, of like this sexually explicit material would be considered as dangerous. They found out. They found out, and I I received. It's like a, a three three tire warning. Um, they basically, if you, if they find any dissident, they usually offer a first warning, which is kind and polite. Please stop the activity. And the second one is very dangerous. It's a, it involves uh, threatening you with an arm. Uh, sorry, a weapon. Like. And what a, did you did you experience? One and two. First, they asked me politely. Uh, to remove all the blog posts and kindly apologize to them and uh, admit in public that they always imagined rather than, um, you know, it's, it's my fault and they tried to, you know, come up with a public apology from my side. But I, I refused it because I thought it's, it's from the classmate of mine. I ignored it and I thought, okay, I will stay silent but I wouldn't take any, I wouldn't delete any. Mm -hmm. But uh, then they visited me. We kind of knew they are uh, coming to our house uh, from the motorcycles because the motorcycles are really loud. The motorcycles they use is it's, it's you deliberate. Could hear this sound coming. It was like yes. a warning. Yes. Yes. So we kind of thought, okay, somebody in the neighborhood is in trouble. But it was us. So my mother oh, oh, didn't open the door. We were in the backyard pretending that no one, nobody had set a home, and we switched off all the, um, uh, you know, any any sound of the radios of uh, all off, and we didn't make a sound. So, but they were knocking. But um, uh, then they came to came to the backyard to look for us. So eventually there was. Uh, they were uh, they were threatening to okay nangal vuta udak udak kaporam bolila variya illa this is okay, they, they were ready to break the house even to and uh, come into it and they were using foul language as well so my mother so my mother told me to wait in the room and she locked the room and she went out to meet them saying that Ma, no he is not here he is staying at his cousin sister's house because he is studying for the exams and they didn't believe her they wanted to check all the house there were three men so. So my, yeah. By then they found out the room was locked, and she, they asked her to open it. So that's how they found out. And um, so, what happened when they saw you? Well, they had guns, and you know how how they threaten you, and basically with a gun. And so, what did they put it against your head, or did they just hold it up to you? Uh, no, put it uh, against my head, and yes, it was. Um, 
pretty humiliating and my mother intervened and they uh, you know she uh, her, she f fell on the floor and you know grabbed their legs and begging and crying and sobbing it was and she uh, promised them that she will make sure that I stay silent and I uh, issue a public apology online and you know delete the blog spot and stuff and but then I didn't go to school we basically got our social worker from um, the hospital to explain all the things to uh, my school after I said for my A levels my mother the first thing my mother did was during the time the travel from Jaffna to Colombo was prohibited we had to get security clearance to uh, go into the capital capital city and it was very hard to obtain a security clearance so um, we had to pay two lakhs two lakhs which is in, uh, two lakhs is um, Bribe or uh, yeah, license? bribe, yeah. bribe. Um, uh, we had to pay uh, lots of money to uh, to get the security clearance from uh, the army. But we had to go through a political party, which is affiliated as paramilitary group. So, yeah, we paid lots of money and got the clearance and went uh, went to live in Colombo. Uh, it was a newfound freedom for me because if you go. Uh, outside the Tamil community you find all these um, you know nearly LGBT lobbying groups and you know they host pride festivals and I attended one and I got a bag home in a ridiculous costume and it was the start of all problems because they didn't like it our neighbors didn't like it yeah it was very uncomfortable for us and they scribbled uh, some derogatory term on the wall and of your apartment yeah of our apartment and um, what, yeah, it wasn't... What did it say? Okay, um, so ba basically they wrote um, this fa foul scribbling on my wall. It's, it's saying, um, in Tamil, it's uh, a coxsucker lives here. So I... Um, yeah, my mother my mother had problems with it because she's a very, you know, cultured woman. She, di doesn't, uh, she likes to interact with the neighbours, but her son being like this wouldn't really... Uh, help her to interact with the new neighbors and stuff and obviously it, it says that somebody in our neighborhood knew specifically who I am and what what I am up to so she thought okay let's move to some other place which is which where nobody cares actually we were looking for our suburbs in Kalambu but that again is a problem for because we are Tamils and we are from Jaffna in our identity card it says we are Tamils so it was hard for us to relocate anywhere in Kalambu other than the Tamil area but we found a neutral Muslim Sinhala area in, in it's called Kalambu 15 uh, and we moved to that area and okay, I was approached by the New York Times because they became familiar with my uh, online writings and they wanted to do an interview about a Tamil a recent Tamil uh, immigrant from uh, Jaffna uh, how, how he feels in Kalambu as a Tamil they wanted to get to know into the um, the, the, the experiences really so they um, they approached me and I said okay I will do the interview and it got published and it got into the attention of a Tamil minister who is affiliated with the government so it's it's kind of against the government and its policies and its practices against Tamil so um, yeah it was they visited us once it, they kindly asked me to you know not to do this again but, um, so they didn't hold guns up to you this time? Not this time, but then again I started an English blog after that. And I started writing about, you know, these things about Sinhala community, Tamil community, blah, blah, blah. And they didn't really like it. So, yeah, again I got into trouble. You and got a second visit? A second visit, but not, not, not with guns, but with threatening behavior. It was frightening enough because we were living in Jaffna and we didn't really have any support network. In Jaffna, when it happened, we had it really so what happened. happened to you then? <laughs> well, even this time, my mother was in, mother intervened and said, oh, he is my only son, please, he is the one all I have for my entire life. I was unaware of this serious situation because, you know, I was only 19. And uh, even though I was f facing persecution, I had support networks from the LGBT group and, uh, you know, that, that sort of support networks. But uh, I perhaps I didn't realize that I... I am in danger because I was oblivious to these things. But my mother made an arrangement to go to, um, you know, come to United Kingdom. Uh, she contacted my cousin who lives here and she borrowed money to get me a student visa. And then that's how I got here. When I came to London, I went to live with my cousin's sister. Um, she is... 
she's she's she, it was shocking for me because um I wasn't expecting this at all I thought they they will be integrated into United Kingdom they will be as you know liberals you know okay with my attitude and stuff but they were more 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 orthodox than the ones anyone I have ever seen in Sri Lanka really they were more orthodox and uh, she ordered me really that's that's how it was she ordered me to cut my hair down and um uh, cut it down and uh, you know behave in a more of an acceptable way like uh, any man of my age does and she wanted me to you know, the uh, same to have the same restrictions and lack of freedom in a free country that in, you had. yeah so what happened then i mean did you continue to live with her or no i lived there for two months because normally i didn't re- uh, have any options to go harry ended up being homeless for 3 months and relied heavily on the support of his university friends Eventually, though, with their help, he was granted asylum. However, it was a struggle to get status based on sexuality alone. Peter Tatchell is a prolific political, lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender or LGBT campaigner. I spoke with him to hear his views on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers and what he calls their abuse by the Home Office. Peter, when most people think of refugees coming to the country, they think of ethnic minorities or political beliefs or maybe religions being persecuted in their own countries. But there's there's other minorities as well. That's right. Um, lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people uh, suffer great persecution around the world. Um, nearly half the countries on this planet still criminalise same-sex relations with penalties ranging from a few years' imprisonment right up to life imprisonment in countries like Uganda and Bangladesh. And in several Islamic states, there is actually the death penalty for same-sex relations. Um, In addition to the legal persecution, there is the persecution from uh, communities, families, uh, and uh, vigilantes. Time and time again, in asylum hearings involving Sri Lankan lesbian and gay refugees, I've heard Home Office barristers and asylum adjudicators not understanding the complexities and real on-the-ground dangers that people face on the grounds of their sexuality or their gender identity. In what way? Well, there's the, one issue is the law, which is pretty straightforward. But the second issue is about how the law is interpreted and enforced. And the third issue is the informal um, community pressure family pressure, religious pressure uh, that is exercised on uh, LGBT uh, people in Sri Lanka. In particular, there are parts of the Muslim community in Sri Lanka which are very, very deeply fundamentalist, very, very heavily influenced by extreme fundamentalist ideas. Uh, And in those communities, gay people are at serious risk of being murdered by their families or communities in so-called honor killings. Um, This is not something that the Home Office and the asylum system adequately addresses and recognizes. Even today, there is no international human rights convention that explicitly and specifically protects lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people against discrimination. And when we look at the Refugee Convention, which governs the rights and responsibilities vis-à-vis refugees fleeing persecution, it lists many grounds but does not explicitly or specifically cite sexual orientation or gender identity as a grounds for refuge. What has happened in Britain in recent years is the Refugee Convention has begun to be interpreted to protect lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people against discrimination and persecution. But that's an interpretation. So not only are you looking out for um, LGBT rights around the world, perhaps in the UK as well, you're looking for a change in legislation. Absolutely. Asylum adjudicators and Home Office asylum barristers now mostly receive education and training in race and ethnic awareness issues, and also in gender awareness issues but not in issues around sexual orientation and gender identity. So some of them still have quite stereotyped views. I mean, I've heard 
an asylum adjudicator say to a very masculine, distracting man that he doesn't look gay and casting doubt and credibility on his gayness and his persecution on the grounds of uh, homosexuality. I've also heard um, an asylum adjudicator say to uh, a woman who's been married with children that this is proof that she can't be a lesbian, completely ignoring the family, religious and cultural community pressures that force many lesbian women into marriages um, in countries where there is no queer social space, where LGBT people don't have any independence from their families or communities. And I know from my own experience of dealing with lesbian and gay asylum seekers from Sri Lanka that the complexities of the situation there are not well understood or acknowledged either by the Home Office, the Border Agency, asylum adjudicators or Home Office barristers. Um, they don't understand the kinds of pressures that exist, the kinds of persecutions that exist. They just look at the formality of the legal code and ignore the reality on the ground where a combination of nationalistic, um, sectarian, religious groups, despite whatever the law may say, actively persecute lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender Sri Lankans. Refugees who end up in the UK. My name is Serin Tako. Um, I'm from Senegal. I'm 24 years old. I've been in the UK for three years now. I came in the UK in December 2008. And what was um, the main uh, motivation for you coming to the UK? I'm, I'm Senegalese and it's a Muslim country. And I'm a homosexual. And I start to I start to know my uh, my sexuality when I was 13 years old, and it's the reason why my my father was sending me to one village. Outside Dhaka, outside Kazamas, the village called Tubamba Bari. The reason why I was there because my my father knew I'm, I'm a homosexual, and he, he asked me. I told him, I told him as well. So he told me you gonna go there. Then I escaped, come back to Dhaka. My my mom helped me to speak to my dad till till he let me stay. And few few months or oh, years later, he. Um, I, the way I was developing and I started have f my first relationship in there, that was when I was uh, 16 years old. And my dad he started to see me the way I was developing and he said he will send me again. And it's why he sent me to the Senegal capital, uh, Dakar, uh, is Senegal, capital of Senegal. And I went there you do me for a course welding, a welding course, to fight to tell me to do a main job. My father was a, a politician as well, and during that those experiences, the president, my dad was following. He he lost his election in 2000, and my father cannot afford to pay the rebels anymore the money he used to pay them to his family to for his family being saved. And my father tried to escape to come to Dakar where I am. During the, when when he was coming and he used a ferry. And that ferry they they have an accident. Is the reason why my family was dying in that accident. And after that, a few weeks later, my auntie called me and she's the one who told me my father is dead. And. She was, she, uh, I couldn't pay the course in Velda anymore and the room I was sleeping, so I, 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 I need to leave the, co the welding course. And uh, <coughs> uh, what happened is my auntie let me stay on her house, and I have a, fr a group of women, they call them, it's like uh, one group of women, they are having party house to the another and, uh, for, the, for my local community. And they, I used to go there having dance with the girls, and, and the community know I'm no interest in to have a sex with the girls, and they call me as a chair chair boy, and it's how my auntie start to know that I'm homosexual. They asked me, I told her the truth. 
and she told me you cannot live any more longer in the house so i have to leave and it's why i stop in the end of on the street and after a few weeks later i find a job working as a prostitute in a poor in dhaka to find something to help myself to it because no one want me near their families and how i start to work there and people start to know people from the area i start to know i'm having a sex with the men in the area so they, they was it was it very dangerous it was very dangerous and the group, group they have been attacked there twice the um, first time they have been stuck on my legs with my foot and I, I managed to escape run away and it's the second time the same thing there was but to kill me and someone who hold my both hands on my back they put it on my back and cross a big knife to my th- then I move then the knife it cross to my chest I have a big scar here then I managed to escape again after that I was so afraid with my life and what, what happened is I talked to one of the my client who was very close friend with me who working at the port and she asked me what happened I told I told him everything and he said he will try, try to help me to leave Senegal and he told me he will go to Spain but that time I don't know <laughs> I don't speak Spanish I don't know nothing about Spain I don't have no friend in there and what happened I, I accepted and he said you cannot take a boat in this port you need to go to a different place because you might find people who know you is what I did go to different area to take a boat fishing boat open boat to get to Canary Island and from the I've been helped from the Spanish authority help me to get to Spain and in Spain for the first time was okay because one of the my one of the uh, Senegalese friend I, m- I met to the camp when he was in Canary helped me to find his uh, cousin in Spain they know they knew that I'm homosexual as well one of the Spanish lady mentioned that to the guy I uh, used to live it and because she, she doesn't think uh, that's uh, his problem or something uh, then the guy called me and asked me if it's that true then I said yes so the guy was a bit surprised why I don't tell him but he spoke to me nicely and he said I cannot leave this house any more longer then it's uh, that, that's why they tell me that I need, that's after that I need to leave again to that house so I, the friend who give me that guy contact he live in that, that time he was in Barcelona and I have another friend who live in Valencia so I got his contact and I went to Valencia and life was very dangerous day for me and I met some Senegalese who used to threat me so it's why or how I tried to escape from Spain to come in UK